Our keynote this morning is going to be delivered by Mr. Siabonga Gama, who is the, as I indicated, at this stage, very prominent fellow in the country. And I know when people hear, as I introduce Transnet, SABC, SAA, okay, you, your, your mind starts rolling. Please don't go there. Because today, what you're going to do, or what you're going to see, is the, an exercise of saying that whilst we develop as a country and things change in the country and, and we go through difficult times, there are also good things happening. And I'm sure that the gamma will also reflect on the good things that are, happen, uh, that are happening in the spheres of Transnet. He's a group chief executive of Transnet SOC Limited. He's a South Africa state owned freight transport and logistics company. He's responsible for driving the company's record breaking 400 billion infrastructure investment program, the market demand strategy. His passion lies in aligning and integrating operational and strategic aspects of the company, growing the business and integrating new markets, including making roads to the rest or inroads to the rest of, Afri of the African continent and the Middle East. He is a seasoned, highly regarded executive and globally recognized as a South African leading expert in railways and ports operations and has received several industry awards. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Dr. Yabonga Gama to address us this morning. Thank you, uh, Program Director. Uh, of course, there are certain names that uh, don't get mentioned in the same breath as Transnet, but uh, we will forgive you. <clears throat> it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. Honorable Deputy Minister for Higher Education and Training, Mr. Mtutuz Manana. Uh, Chairperson of uh, Regenesis, Dr. Marco Saravagna. Uh, founding Director of Regenesis, Mr. William Vivian, and, and uh, Program Director. CEO of uh, Regenesis, uh, Ms. Sigi Brownlee. Dean of Regenesis, Dr. Penny Law, uh, Mr. Raymond and Mrs. Wendy Ackerman. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, graduates and their families, ladies and gentlemen. With uh, this memorable opening, the English author Charles Dickens uh, summed up his intense feelings about an epochal event, the French Revolution that shook the very foundations of the world we live in. This was in his book, A Tale of Two Cities, which was written in 1859. I recite these words this morning because lately every day in South Africa feels like the storming of the gates. As our country ages over so ponderously into the 21st century, we can be forgiven for thinking that we're experiencing our own revolution every week or so. Student protests, economic uncertainty, state paralysis, the list is endless. There is no doubt that economic uncertainty is the new norm. We are now in the throes of unparalleled economic turbulence. We have to remember though that the French Revolution was in fact precipitated by economic issues largely debt as a result of French participation in the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution. To many of us, this may seem unnerving, but this is also a time of tremendous opportunity, freedom, and creativity. The great film director, Orson Welles, put it succinctly in his film, The Third Man, when he said, in Italy, for 30 years, under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed. 
but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love, they had 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. Close quotes. I'm not saying that we must create our own generation of Bojas, but make no mistake, we live in a time of unprecedented opportunity. It is up to us to seize the moment despite the turbulence and the global uncertainties. We can do this precisely because of the profound changes that are taking place around us, particularly the fourth industrial revolution that we are in the midst of. As Klaus Schwab, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, has recently pointed out, we are at the precipice of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, that will fundamentally alter the way we work, that will fundamentally alter the way we relate to one another. In its scale, in its scope and complexity, the transformation will be unlike any human, anything that humankind has experienced before. We do not yet know how it will unfold, but one thing is clear. The response to it must be integrated and comprehensive, involving all stakeholders of the global polity, from the public and private sectors to academia and civil society. In the World Economic Forum's Global Information Technology Report 2016, which was published in July, only seven countries, Finland, Switzerland, Sweden, Israel, Singapore, the Netherlands, and the United States are leading the world when it comes to generating economic impact from investments in information and, and communication technologies. The seven are all known for being early and enthusiastic adopt adopters of ICT, and their emergence is significant as it demonstrates that adoption of ICTs coupled with the supportive, enabling environment characterized by sound regulation, quality infrastructure, and ready skills supply, among other factors, can pave the way to wider benefits. Richard Summons, uh, head of the Center for the Global Agenda of the World Economic Forum, put it succinctly when he said recently, the digital economy is an essential part of the architecture of the fourth industrial revolution. In order for digital technology to continue contributing economic and social impact, societies need to anticipate its effects on markets and to ensure a fair deal for workers in digitized market environments. New models of governance will be key in this close quote. You will be glad to know that South Africa improves markedly in the uh, WEF report and uh, climbed 10 places to 65th place. We still have a long way to go, though, and our competitors uh, are snipping at our heels. But uh, if you also look at the Global Competitiveness Report uh, issued by the IMD, you would see that South Africa has climbed to 52nd in the world, which means we are making good progress. As an example, China, which has been for the couple of uh, uh, last decades uh, the mainstay of our markets, is now changing. They are no longer the resource-hungry country that they, want, th that they once were. Uh, they are now uh, diversifying uh, into a technology-driven as well as a knowledge-driven economy. In addition, China is experiencing the lowest growth rates in the recent history. Their single-digit growth is now the norm, and the Chinese government is embarking on unprecedented measures of frugality. There are, however, vast opportunities if we know where to look. Take India, for example. It offers a rapidly rising middle class voracious in their demand for goods. The new Indian government is exceptionally business friendly and has undertaken a great deal of deregulation to make doing business in India much easier. They've introduced uh, arbitration uh, instead of uh, litigation as a form of um, settling business disputes, but also they have limited the number of years that it takes uh, for these disputes uh, to be settled. The noted journalist Gideon Rashman, who served as a correspondent for both the Financial Times and The Economist, published a noteworthy book in August this year. It's called Easternization. In it, it describes how, since the financial crisis, 
the West's decline and China's rise have accelerated. He demonstrates how year by year the world is being redrawn in the most profound, profound ways by this shift in global power. We are noticing this shift in our own backyards. I don't know if any of us have noticed, but the outsiders, especially the Asian countries, are eating our lunch on our own continent. Recently, there was a striking observation in The Economist. A journalist passing through Addis Ababa airport in Ethiopia noted wryly that you have a better chance of buying Asian dumplings in the numerous restaurants in the airport than you have of getting any Ethiopian food. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to up our game. In many ways, we at Transnet are experiencing our own uh, revolution. We have been given an unprecedented opportunity to reshape and reimagine the transport landscape, an opportunity that is not likely to be revisited upon us anytime soon. A brief background. Transnet is uh, South Africa's state-owned uh, freight, transport, and logistics infrastructure company. It's the custodian of the country's rail, ports, and pipeline network. We have nine commercial ports across the 3,300 kilometers of uh, South Africa's coastline. We have 30,000 kilometers of rail network and some 3,800 kilometers of pipeline carrying gas and liquid fuels. In 2015, our railways handled 226 million tons of freight. As a proudly state-owned company, Transnet has a dual mandate. We are required to provide world-class infrastructure and technology as part of our mandate to catalyze economic growth. At the same time, we are at the forefront of driving South Africa's developmental objectives. Our greatest challenge is perhaps the facilitation of a large-scale shift of traffic from road to rail. In April 2012, we launched our market demand strategy. This is a strategy which is aimed at uh, strengthening South Africa's logistics backbone and positioning our supply chains to better compete in global terms. Since 2012, we have spent an unprecedented 108 billion rand in our rail, in our ports, and pipeline infrastructure. And in terms of the world competitiveness reports on logistics, we have climbed from number 34 to number 20 in the world by 2016. By 2022, we would have spent just over half a trillion rand on our capital investment program. We have one single-minded goal in mind, an overwhelming desire to create a modern integrated freight and logistics system for South Africa, whilst aggressively pursuing a road to rail strategy for the betterment of our economy. This will ultimately position South Africa on a beneficial supply chain curve. We at Transnet therefore count ourselves as extremely fortunate that we are able to shape the future of our nation in the manner we are doing. We are also more excited at realizing Africa's dreams at a pace of implementation that is hitherto unheard of in our continent. Going forward as a 3PL, we are an asset-based provider of services limited to our own assets. However, the future is in 4PL, where we, are, we will extend our services to incorporate other value-added services in the entire logistics supply chain. This is the only approach that can ensure a sustainable road to rail shift. We must create asset light, multiple revenue streams in order to grow, diversify, and de-risk our business. As we modernize our infrastructure, we're also embarking on a journey of innovation where we are placing research and development at the center of our developmental work. We aim to learn from those of you who have made significant inventions so that we do not tread mill on terrain that has already been traversed. We also aim to translate our knowledge of the African continent to create products that are user-friendly and customized to the unique needs of Africans. In so doing, we'll partner with others here today who are willing to share their expertise and experiences with us, those who are willing to create genuine partnerships based on integrity and trust and a desire to take our continent forward. As pioneers, we will continue to look at efforts to further industrialize our country, to invest in technology that improves the logistics competitiveness of our country and our continent. 
we are looking at a number of cutting-edge breakthroughs that will reflect our pioneering spirit. Our service offering to new and existing customers has to be cutting-edge, it has to be state-of-the-art and digitally supported, and most importantly, seamless, reliable, visible, and it must touch the lives of human beings. Graduates, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, our future is digital, and we must evolve or die. We need to add an in intellectual capital to create value from the billions we are pouring into physical capital. As I end, my apologies for quoting from another business school leader. Uh, but Bruno Lanvin, who is an executive director at INSEAD Business School, recently name-checked South Africa when he wrote, digital is not just about technology. It is a state of mind and the source of new business models, new consumption patterns, new ways for business and individuals to organize, produce, trade, and innovate. In the global game of digital innovation, the performance and progress made by emerging economies such as Singapore, the United Arab Emirates, or South Africa, for example, are remarkable. They may hold the promise of even more spectacular improvements in the ways digital technologies will be harnessed to competitiveness, growth, and social progress in the coming years. So at Transnet, we're willing to learn and are willing to share in a vastly globalizing world so that our business activity can always bring about a better life for all. On the 5th of April, 1906, in New York, a remarkable young man stood up and gave an impassioned speech at the University of Columbia. The student's name was Pixligai Saga Seme, and the speech was called The Regeneration of Africa. It won the George William Curtis Medal the university, uh, university's highest oratorial honor. Pixley Gai Sagaseme, born in northern Natal and raised at the Inanda Mission, was a founder member of the South African Native National Congress on January 8, 1912. He had an abiding passion for Africa in particular, and in ensuring that the continent threw off its shackles of colonialism and took its rightful place in the world, as a powerful, industrious, and modern continent. You could say he was remarkably ahead of his time. I would like to end with his final inspiring words, and I quote, the brighter day is, ri is rising upon Africa. Already I seem to see her chains dissolved, her desert plains red with harvest, her Apisnia, her Apisnia and her Zululand, the seats of science and religion, reflecting the glory of the rising sun from the spires of their churches and universities. Her Congo and her Gambia, whitened with commerce, her crowded cities, sending forth the harm of business. Let us go out there and prove our dictators wrong, that, that we can have our, our Apisnia and our Zululand, the seats of science, that our cities do indeed harm, and the sound of business um, and industry. Strategic genius and tactical acumen on the battlefield that you enter today will bear the fruits of success for years to come. Good luck, uh, best wishes, and please do not forget to change the world and make it a better place than you found it. After every revolution must be a resurrection. And as Charles Dickens said, we had everything before us. I thank you.